are joined by Mr. Alex Makaisa. Some of you know him as Sir Alex, some call him Alex, some call him Dr. Makaisa. Someone posted uh, a link to, uh, uh, to the BSR and someone asked the question, who is this Alex Makaisa? So I will start with that question. Who is this Alex Makaisa? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, my full name is Alex Tawanda Magaisa. If you go back to my village and ask for Alex, you probably won't, won't find anybody who, who knows him. But uh, if you ask for Tawanda, uh, they know me as the small boy who grew up among them. Um, so so that's, that's me. Uh, uh, I, I come from Chikomba, a district uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, I grew up uh, there in the early part of my life, and then I went to to Arare, where I did my primary schooling, as well as um, secondary school at uh, at uh, at a Catholic boarding school. Uh, probably we'll talk a, a little bit more about this later, <laughs> if you do ask. But uh, essentially, I'm a I'm a lecturer in law. I I teach law at the University of Kent, and I've been here for quite a few years now in the UK. I'm Zimbabwean, as I have already said, uh, very much in love with my country, very much in touch with my roots. And I write uh, on a regular basis on issues concerning Zimbabwe. Uh, you've mentioned the BSR, the Big Saturday Read, uh, which is the flagship uh, blog, which I use uh, to communicate my thoughts and my ideas on issues to do with politics, uh, to do with law, as well as the economy. Uh, so in short, uh, that's me. But maybe uh, you may have other questions later, which will reveal a little bit more about my biography. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. I think you, you have got a, a, a quite a, a portfolio in terms of you know the number of things that you have been involved in. And we'll get to, to some of that uh, as well later. Um, let's talk about Zimbabwe, because I think most people, that's what they know you through. And, uh, and that's what a lot of people, you have become a voice to reckon. I, I remember from the original days of your uh, a blog when it was still the Alex Magaisa uh, before it was rebranded, uh, I used to read some of your articles then. But living in the diaspora, what is the perception of Zimbabwe from out of Zimbabwe? What? Do people perceive Zimbabwe as now? Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually quite uh, disappointing uh, because the perception of Zimbabwe is that of a, a, a tin pot dictatorship, you know, a country that is mired in poverty, a country that has endemic uh, bad governance, a country where uh, the currency hit record levels of hyperinflation and uh, Zimbabwe had to abandon its currency. We have almost become like the flagship or the poster child of how not to govern a country. Um, Zimbabwe used to have a lot of uh, uh, promise. A lot of people believed in it, especially in the 1980s. There were a lot of challenges, of course, but uh, the rest of the world thought that Zimbabwe was a country of rich promise that could achieve so much more for the continent. And unfortunately, we have uh, regressed a lot uh, during the course of the last uh, 40 years, and especially in the last 20 years. So the perception of Zimbabwe is, is that of a country which is pitied, uh, a country where if you mention that you are from Zimbabwe, the next thing is people feel sorry for you. Um, young people, you know, I even shy to declare their Zimbabweanness because of of those uh, perceptions. So it's quite an unfortunate situation, but that's where we are at the moment. I've actually had that experience as well um, elsewhere in the world whilst I was traveling. And some people, Zimbabweans, told me point blank that when we are asked where are we from, we rather say we are from South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it's a, it's a very unfortunate situation. Uh, I get many young people uh, who come to my university, for example, during their first year. And um, when I ask them, you know, I normally sort of ask all the students because we have lots of 
international students. So I introduced myself very proudly as a Zimbabwean because I'm proud to be a Zimbabwean. And um, I then ask each one of them to tell me where they're from. And um, you, you get a lot of young people uh, and you can tell by the accent and sometimes you can tell by the name because they'll be called Tendai or Fadzai, you know, or Tawanda. Uh, but they tell you that they are from Botswana or from South Africa. And uh, but the fascinating thing is that after about two, three weeks uh, of teaching and uh, of, you know, because you try to make everybody comfortable, they then, you know, come back and sort of introduce myself. I remember last year I got quite a few introducing me or oh, my father. Uh, is from Zimbabwe, and <laughs> my father says hello. Uh, my father says I should I should greet you, and so they start introducing myself. And then immediately when they do that, I start speaking to them in Shona or even throw in a word of Ndebele. Uh, you know, I'm not very fluent in Ndebele, but I just sort of say a word which uh, makes them feel comfortable, and they they begin to feel more and more comfortable. And I always say to them, you know, I'm here and I teach you guys, and I always do the best I can. Uh, I think they feel more comfortable because we like to do a good job in, in at work. And uh, when, when you do a good job, they also feel very proud of uh, the fact that this man is from our country and they begin to feel proud of associating with Zimbabwe. So uh, it, it's excellent. You know, it, it's unfortunate that our country is in such trouble uh, and, and, and that our young people, you know, they, they do feel shy or embarrassed <laughs> about association with it. Uh, but it's our job to make them feel comfortable. Yeah, and I, I, I must say that uh, I've had that experience as well. I, I knew someone for four years, mm -hmm. uh, and they were using a, a different name. And one day I saw an email address that they had brought uh, down, mm -hmm. which had a shown apart on the email address. <laughs> and uh, I asked them, strange, like, how come your email address has got a shown apart? And they said, yeah, because my parents are from Zimbabwe. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, and and I'm, I'm asking myself four years down the line, you know, we couldn't do that. But but this is what we have become. And, and, and this is just the reality of things. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I, I understand that that's the perception, you know, of the country. But uh, in, in, in as few words as you can, What's your perception of the country? Because this is this is also you know a, a question that I've, I've I've found a lot of people ask. A lot of people you meet them and you know they give you their perception about the country, and then some take time to ask you, what what exactly is the situation in Zimbabwe, and you have to now internalize it and try and give that you know your own perception of the country as well as a Zimbabwe. Well, you know, Stan, um, we, we, we learned that we cannot describe a country in a single line. Uh, Zimbabwe is a very complex country. So every time that somebody asks me what my perception of Zimbabwe is, uh, my answer to them is that Zimbabwe is, a, is like any other country. It's a multifaceted uh, country. <clears throat> it has a uh, uh, excellent points, uh, but but it also has some some very ugly points. So I think it's important to acknowledge the complexity and not to simplify the story of Zimbabwe. Just as we don't want to simplify the story of Africa, uh, it's a complex continent with many different experiences, with so much uh, diversities. So. Yes, Zimbabwe is, 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 is in a difficult spot at the moment. I think it's got a very uh, a bad government, a government which is unresponsive to the needs of the people, a government which is inept. But Zimbabwe is also the same country of uh, the majestic Victoria Falls, the uh, majesty of the mountains in the Eastern Highlands. It's also a country of so much uh, beauty a beautiful climate, uh, but more importantly, it's a country of uh, very beautiful people, uh, beautiful at heart, uh, people who are very kind. I don't think that you get so many countries in the world uh, such as you would have among Zimbabweans, peace loving. Uh, you have to push them very hard to get them angry. And uh, they often look after 
uh, people, doesn't matter whether you're a stranger, and they, they do their best. They go out of their way to make somebody comfortable. I don't think that there is any Zimbabwean or any foreigner who has been to Zimbabwe who has not been charmed uh, by the generosity and uh, the kindness of Zimbabwe. So I think it's a it's an absolutely beautiful country, which unfortunately has a has an ugly government. Yeah, and and uh, you know I, I like the point you make, but we can come that uh, to that maybe later about how difficult it is to get a Zimbabwe angry. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I, I think I am very much conflicted about that point in terms mm -hmm. of whether it's difficult to get a Zimbabwean angry or it's difficult to get them angry enough to take action. But but we can. <laughs> uh, yeah. Talking about you know how is Zimbabweans you know how good the country is how you know beautiful a beautiful history we have you know great people we have. Um, where did we go wrong? Because I, I think there are a great of a lot of great things that have happened, and mm -hmm. one can take a lot of you know hindsight look at the whole question. But I think we've discussed 1980, the war, and everything's just too many times. Let's start in 20, 2009. We go into a GNU, mm -hmm. and it seems like things blew. The likes of Mr. Magaisa even get involved. Mm -hmm. um, in, in some government space, whichever way you, know, you explain to me maybe how you categorize it. Mm -hmm. But we get to 2013. We get to 2017. We get to where we are now in 2020. The past 10 years, a lot has gone well and a lot has gone wrong. What went wrong? Why are we where we are sitting now today in 2020? Can you mm -hmm. take me <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it, it's an important question, but but also, uh, Stan, it's very difficult for us to do what you want us to do, which is to start from 2009. Um, you know, as as uh, I'm a lawyer, but I, I also love history a lot. So so unfortunately, we, we can You also have answers. Yeah. <laughs> so I can we cannot ignore. What happened before 2020 or nine? You know, what, what led us to 2009 was that we had a, a, a very a highly inconclusive election. Uh, we had a lot of violence that took place in Zimbabwe. Uh, a lot of people were killed. A lot of homes were were burned down. A lot of people were displaced, and that created a crisis, uh, which required some kind of resolution. Uh, and then that resolution was the inclusive government. But you know, we had been there before with uh, Gukura Hundi in the 1980s. So when people say, when did we, where did we go wrong? We went wrong from the very beginning because we had a government which uh, pretended to be doing something, but uh, in actual effect was doing some very bad things. So that's why a lot of people in the rest of the country were not, uh, may not have been aware of what was happening in Matabeleland and uh, the Midlands where uh, thousands of people were killed. Thousands of civilians were, were were killed by by government forces. So everything that we are seeing today has a history. Is these are things that have happened in the past, and, and so we 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 cannot have a, a sort of a take off or a cut off date where we say things started being bad at this particular point in time. Our situation has a pattern uh, which has been there. But let me go to the inclusive government which you made reference to and, and before you go there mr magaisa uh, yeah 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 you know why you know there's this idea of you know starting from the inclusive government mm -hmm. where did it go wrong it's because exactly like you said we did what we did until 1980 things happened until 1987 mm -hmm. things happened until 2000 things happened and there is this cycle and mm -hmm. one Times tries to think to say, if you look at how things got bad in 2008 and how things got bad in 2019, 2020, mm -hmm. there's certain similarities that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, where we are going to go from here, I wouldn't know. I think if I had that answer, I would be a very rich guy. A very, very rich guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's that issue of, I think, and still feel that diagnosis becomes, because it's still very close to home, uh, becomes very 
crucial at this stage because mm-hmm. if if something was not done right there and we repeat that for whatever reason, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I no, don't know. But... No, 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 you've got you've got a very fundamental point there. Uh, so so essentially what you are saying and which I agree with is that you should not repeat the mistake of 2009. What what were the mistakes of 2009? Uh, what were the good points about it? Well, I think that the country was going through a very, very serious crisis in 2008, which is quite similar to where we are right now. And um, there was a perception at the time that maybe if the uh, opposition got into talks with the ruling party, ZANU-PF, uh, then come into some form of a coalition arrangement, that would solve things for Zimbabwe. Now, but I, I don't think that there was sufficient preparation on the part of the opposition to go into that negotiation. So they went into a negotiation, I think they were underprepared for what they were facing. Uh, the other problem also was that the broker was not honest. The intermediator between ZANU-PF and the MDC was President Tabo Mbeki. And President Tabo Mbeki has always betted for President Mugabe, if not ZANU-PF itself, he he always had a, a, a partiality towards them. And uh, it was very difficult for Morgan Changirai. I think they, they had a very nasty exchange even during those negotiations, which eventually died down, but it did not remove the suspicions. Now, this went on again, you know, even when President Zuma was in power, uh, even President Motlande for the few months that he was in power in South Africa. This is partly because of the liberation connections between ZANU-PF and the ANC. So there was under preparation. There was no honest broker. Uh, the deal was uh, agreed, but it was a bad deal. Uh, it was a bad deal because it did not give power to the opposition, to the FDC. They were in government, but they did not have power. Now, I know this because later on during the GNU, I went to work with uh, Mr. Changirai, uh, Dr. Changirai, as his chief of staff and, and uh, that can, was in 2012 2013 mm-hmm. can we put a comma there i i i mm-hmm. I, I, I don't want us to 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 pass this point mm-hmm. without asking this question mm-hmm. based on that 2009 mm-hmm. experience with south africa mm-hmm. and you know the presidents and what have happened would you would you today still bank on south africa becoming part of it or you'd only, in, in your view, maybe give it that the benefit of the doubt if the likes of Julius Malema are involved. I saw he tweeted uh, uh, tw- uh, two days or so ago about you know uh, uh, the situation and tweeting uh, President Nangago. Well, you know, I am very disappointed with uh, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. He is someone that I always uh, thought that would be a good leader. That was a long time ago when he was still uh, in the, you know, negotiating uh, the uh, South African constitution. He did a, a he did an interesting, uh, a good job, I think, by and large, to help South Africa get through uh, that era, which was a very difficult one. And um, you know, even when President Mbeki became president, I always thought uh, Ramaphosa would one day become president. But uh, I think that he has been a, a huge disappointment so far. He has not shown the courage uh, that we would expect of a person uh, of his background in trade unionism. Uh, I think that uh, he has uh, shown a timidity when dealing with Zimbabwe, some kind of a lack of courage when, when engaging Zimbabwe. But I think this is also partly because South Africa has got so many huge problems. Uh, and some of the things that Zimbabwe has done South Africa might want to do or South Africa might do, you know, in the future. And so they are conflicted when they come to deal with Zimbabwe. So, for example, the land question, for example, it's a a very difficult issue for South Africa, which it has to deal with at some point. And uh, so they find it very difficult to condemn Zimbabwe, uh, which has gone through this process. And and those are some of the the limitations they face. I don't think that uh, he would be an honest broker. <laughs> you know, I don't think that he would be a, an impartial one. But unfortunately, he is the one who has got uh, the power and leverage uh, over over Zimbabwe, over the leadership in Zimbabwe, both in the ruling party and the opposition. And I think also other powers around the world they rely on South Africa 
to take an important role in there. But as you say, it may be useful to get other players involved. Uh, I think that the challenge that uh, President Ramaphosa is now facing is that Zimbabwe has become more of a domestic issue for South Africa. And uh, so they have to deal with it. It has become part of the politics of South Africa, particularly because of the refugee crisis. You know, you've got economic refugees in, in South Africa, uh, millions coming from Zimbabwe and more people wanting to go to South Africa. So you have seen the ANC is now speak, beginning to speak about the crisis in Zimbabwe. I hope that uh, they will bring some pressure to bear on their uh, peers in Zimbabwe. But uh, I am not uh, op optimistic. I'm not uh, very hopeful. I think that pressure will have to come from, from elsewhere. Elsewhere. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so you were now t t t talking to me about now when we went, you know, after these uh, very uh, tricky negotiations, you then went also uh, mm -hmm. to work with Mr. Morgan Trangirai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, we would, like I said, we were in government, but uh, I discovered that we did not have power because there were so many things that we wanted to do, uh, so many things that we put on the table. Uh, so many things that were accepted even by Mugabe as president, but they never just they just never went through. Uh, to give you an example, uh, at one point I was given a task uh, by both President Mugabe and uh, Prime Minister Changirai to uh, do a code of conduct for the military uh, during times of uh, elections. And uh, my team and I sat down and we did this code of conduct. Uh, Prime Minister Tsangirai took it to President Mugabe at the uh, Monday meeting. They used to have a regular Monday meeting. Uh, I used to be the one who drafted the agenda for the two men, what they were going to discuss and the expected outcomes. And uh, the code of conduct was one of them on one occasion, and it was accepted. President Mugabe accepted that it was a, a good code of conduct, which uh, he would be passing on to his colleagues in the military. And uh, so I think that he took it over to the uh, uh, JOC, <laughs> Joint Operations Command, uh, or the military leaders. And uh, I, I think maybe they, they simply uh, did not I, accept I, I, it I, ever again. And uh, I don't know <laughs> if he's still there. <laughs> Mr. Magaisa, you, you, I, I feel to some extent you do a disservice to, to Zimbabweans because there is so much experience and exposure you have had that a lot of people don't know about. And, <laughs> and because, you know, a lot of people, uh, whether in the pub, you know, in the church, yeah, or yeah. Everything, there's always this discussion about what was happening during the GNU. Yeah, and yeah. And <laughs> that some people have had about was Mugabe his own man or not? <laughs> so this is a quick question. Just, just can we just detour a bit? I, I, I'm sorry to keep doing this to you. you know, I don't want no. to. No, it's okay. It's okay. Look, uh, he, 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 you know, I, I accept that we need to write our own stories, and that's part of the reason why I have the BSR. The BSR is there to document our stories. But I have bigger work which will be coming in the future which talks about my experiences during the GNU. Uh, I'm sure it will be a fascinating tale wow. for many Zimbabweans who would want to hear what was happening at the time and, and my experiences as a chief of staff in, in, in that government. Uh, but yeah, you know, coming to your question, President Mugabe, he was a complex man. You know, this is all I can say. He was a complex man. I think it's easy to, to uh, you know, describe him in, in one word or in one line. Uh, his relationship with uh, the military. He was a very powerful man. They respected him. They were loyal to him because of their history, the history they shared with him. But at the same time, uh, they were also a power unto themselves. They also recognized their power. And uh, so whatever Mugabe did, he needed a buy-in from the military. Those are the people who had kept him in power in 2008 when he lost to Morgan Trangirai. So in some ways he was beholden to them, uh, but in some ways they were also uh, loyal to him uh, because of the history that they had had for a very long time. So it was a balancing act. I mean, Mugabe was, a, he knew how to handle power. He knew how to control people. And uh, he used that power very effectively. And I mean, he could make people comfortable. He made people like Prime Minister Trangirai uh, very comfortable. You know, but at the same time, 
he was doing a lot of other things on the side. So he was a very crafty uh, old man who knew how to work his way through power. So I wouldn't say that he was under the generals, but I also wouldn't say that he was completely above them. They were working together in a sort of a symbiotic relationship. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Yes. Uh, then, so you can you can continue yeah on the on the on the on the other point. Yes. So so I was well. I mean, the point really I was making was that uh, the GNU was a, a great idea in principle, but the the practical the practicalities of the GNU were weak. Uh, the fundamentals were weak. Uh, ZANU-PF continued to have a disproportionate amount of power. You know, they controlled uh, the civil service, they controlled, uh, you know, the parastatals, they controlled, you know, the commissions. They, they, there was a, a, a an attempt to bring in the opposition and to give them, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. They controlled the powerful ministries, you know, defense, home affairs, even though the MDC had a co-minister of home affairs, the minister of home, she didn't have any power. The power was in the zanu -PF people, you know, all the but, senior civil servants were zanu -PF people. So yeah. if you are going to have an arrangement, and this is the point I want to make, Stan, if you are going to have an arrangement going forward, it has to be an arrangement that understands and appreciates the weaknesses of the GNU. And why, you know, people sometimes ask me, why did you guys not push for this? They don't realize that we did. We did. We pushed a lot for a lot of things. Some of them happened. I mean, look, we had a new constitution. I think it was a great achievement. People underestimated because ZANU-PF absolutely did not want a new constitution. Not at all. But we managed to get that. But there were many other things that we also couldn't get. And that was because ZANU-PF was in control. And yeah. uh, we were just there almost as tokens. But you know the 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 other interesting point that uh, you know some people make is to what extent is the ordinary man on the street concerned about who is in power? In the sense that, like what you say, that during the GNU, um, you know, it was crafted in a manner and way in which uh, you know Zanopiev still was holding power, but the ordinary man on the street was beginning to get a job, was beginning to be able to feed his family, was beginning to be able to send their children to schools and uh, where they would want to. And as a result, regardless of what was the power structure and the power struggles, the ordinary man was to some extent happy. Yeah. And okay. this is no. part of even when you look at the different detractors of you know the MDC and the issue about sanctions, and, it, it, it comes to that way people at times just say, I don't really care about that. I just want to feed my family. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're making a very important point. Uh, you know, but again, and, and sorry, I keep going to that same word again. It, it, it's, everything is, is more complex than it appears. There, there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes. So, for example, you're, you're quite right that ZANU-PF had control of the political institutions they did have control of the political institutions and that's why it made it very difficult to reform to to include those reforms however the economic uh, elements were in the hands of the mdc or opposition elements so for example the finance ministry was managed by tendai Biti. Uh, you know who could have done even better you know our economy could have even done much much better for example if uh, the Chiaz got diamonds had been brought into the national fiscus. But Tendai Biti could not get his hands on the diamond money. The diamond money was almost something that was happening offshore. It was something that was happening. It was like there was a parallel sort of government which was run by Zanu PF. Diamonds under Obit Mpofu who was the minister of mines at the time. And the parastatals and the Chinese companies, they were doing their thing. Now imagine if that money had been brought into the national economy and Tendai BT was in charge of that. You know, I think that we would have done even better than we were doing. But look at it this way. We had these ministries which were being run by the uh, opposition, even, uh, you know, energy and, and other ministries which were involved or, you know, involved in economic or social matters. 
they did very well. And as you said, people were happy. Uh, people were relatively more comfortable than they were before 2009. And suddenly they were more comfortable then than they are now after 2013. If you look at the trajectory, things began to really go south after 2013, 2014, 2015. And then of course we end up with all this useless bond currency. And now the equally useless Zimbabwe dollar with Professor Mtulin Gum as, uh, as uh, the finance minister. So uh, do people care who is in power? I think people care that there is a good leader, that there are people who are willing to put their interests first. That's important. There is also uh, uh, the point about having the international community having confidence in the country. It's all about the people they see. You know, the international community was looking at the GNU. They were seeing the opposition involved there. They were able to put in money. It wasn't coming directly through government, but it was going through, you know, civil society. It was going through the projects that were being run, uh, provided by multilateral institutions. You need that. So does it matter who is in charge? I think that it matters that uh, ZANU-PF is not in charge because they've shown themselves to be incompetent and inept, certainly not in sole charge. But Zimbabwe needs something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's fast forward and close the 2013 chapter. Mm -hmm. After the five years, we have a new constitution. Mm -hmm. uh, things have happened. Now, we don't have some of the reforms. We don't have some of the laws that allow us to use parts of the constitution. What went wrong? Because that then became the beginning of the demise again. Um, a lot of people ask the question, and when they ask that question, there's even questions about why didn't the guys just, you know, continue? Well, why? why <laughs> you know, um, what went wrong? Can you just that's mm, ten? Let me go back to 2013. You know, people sometimes forget. Uh, we, and when I say we, I mean, you know, the prime minister, the MDC at the time in 2013, we didn't want to end the GNU in 2013. If anything, we went out of our way to try and prolong the government of national unity. And we did so because we genuinely believed, number one, that Zimbabwe was in a good place a, with a coalition arrangement that was in place. Remember that elections had been suspended. There were no by-elections. So there was no acrimony. There was no fighting. And resources were being put to good use uh, at the time. We also did so because we believed that we had not achieved the reforms that we needed. And that we had only just achieved the constitution in early 2013, but we had not had sufficient time for the constitution to be implemented for the values and principles that we had championed to take full effect in the country we wanted a bit more time and we just thought that it was not the right time for zimbabwe to go into an election so if anything we were ridiculed for wanting the gnu to continue because our detractors were now saying oh these guys are afraid of elections they're they don't eating. want elections because yeah they are eating they are too comfortable in government. And ZANU-PF, of course, used this to great effect, to say that these people are resisting elections because they are scared of losing. Do you, and do you know what? We, do you, we, I, I just want to, just a quick comment. Do you think mm -hmm. that was a good decision, actually, also on ZANU-PF's part, or for, for their own good? Was it good for them? No, it wasn't good for them. It wasn't good for, for them. But you see, I think they were del deluded. And I still don't understand because I thought Mugabe was in a good place. He was there as almost a figurehead. The economy was doing well. He could even have taken credit for what was yes. going on. But for some reason, they seemed so hell-bent uh, on, on going into an election and uh, becoming the sole governors of the country. So anyway, they went. we went into an election uh, against our will because we did not think that Zimbabwe was ready for a free and fair election. And of course, things happened in 2013. We believe that there was a lot of rigging that took place. ZANU-PF remained in power, now on its own. Eh? Then we said, if you remember, 
the slogan at that time was Chitonga Ituone, you know, <laughs> now you can rule. Let's see what you can achieve. Now, this wasn't because people wished Zimbabwe to do badly, to, to fare badly, no. It was simply because we knew from the history and the record of Zanupio that it wasn't going to end well. And that is precisely what happened because, you know, just a few months after Sunny PF took sole charge of the country, things began to deteriorate. And of course, Zimbabweans, you know, we, we, we were simply adjusting to the new reality, hoping that uh, things would change, Chaita, Chachinja. But, you know, things went on. And then we had, as, like I said to you, we, we no longer had sufficient currency, the protein new diabolical stupid economic policies which plunged Zimbabwe into into further chaos and the shocking thing is that the very same people who had pushed Mugabe to go into elections in 2013 what did they do they could not even wait for 2018 for elections they pushed him out in 2017 through a coup yeah mm -hmm. so so the just to close the GNU chapter would you characterize the GNU as one of the greatest successes of MDC or one of its greatest failures? <laughs> I know that. <they> are... <laughs> yeah, it's a but... it's a it's a good question. It's a good question, but uh, one that is impossible to answer in that way. Uh, again, because it's a, it's a very complex uh, uh, question. I think that it was. Um, I think it was great for. I don't think it was great for the MDC, to be honest. I think it was great for Zimbabweans who had a breather during that time. Because if you remember how bad things were in 2008, I think a lot of Zimbabweans were grateful that they had this respite in 2009 and that the MDC was able to come down and humble itself, you know, to get into a coalition with a party that had brutalized you know, that had killed these people, that had tortured these people. You know, yeah. people don't understand and appreciate the sacrifice that the MDC leaders and the MDC as a party made in order to get into that GNU. So so I think it was great. But I think the MDC paid a heavy price for, for, for that. Because then, of course, uh, they began to be compared with ZANU-PF. They are all the same. Uh, you know, the ills of the government were also attached to them. Uh, and people did not seem to give credit to uh, the successes that were achieved, especially on the economic front. So, so I think that it was good for Zimbabweans. I think it, I think the, the Zimbabweans were saved by what happened in 2009, that sacrifice. But I don't think it was great for the MDC. No, I think it, uh, it, it certainly affected the MDC and how it was perceived by the people, by some people outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we move to a different uh, time. You were one of the first people, I think I saw you on BBC or CNN, mm -hmm. talking and commenting about uh, finally Robert Mugabe is no longer the president of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a certain yeah. euphoria, um, I don't know, excitement. It was crazy. Um, people like myself um, who were born way post 1980, we found ourselves in a situation whereby really does it make sense to be asked who is the president of Zimbabwe and not say it's Robert Mugabe? Because that was a question we used to answer all the way from primary school, from grade one. Mm -hmm. So, But it became possible to say, oh, it's possible that in Zimbabwe there can be a different president other than Robert Mugabe. There was a lot of goodwill. And a lot of people felt that, not necessarily about looking at the delivery of what Mugabe had done for the 30 or 37 years, but just about the situation in the country. A lot of people thought you can never, anyone who you put in this position is going to do better. They, they, you're not going to have worse than what it is. Everyone was excited or maybe not everyone, you find one or two people. And where did we go wrong? It's, it's really a, a question that I feel, even today, um, because we don't have that answer, a lot of apathy comes from that. 
a lot mm. of, you know, the, the, the opposition itself, 23 different parties, um, everyone wants to be a president. Um, you know, it's just, there's just this disjointedness where people just kind of feel hopeless, uh, confused and lost. What happened wrong? <laughs> well, uh, you know, you are talking about the coup. Uh, let me say this, uh, Stan. I was one of the few people who called a spade a spade. Uh, on the day that the tanks were rolling into Arare, I said that this is a coup. And I said that uh, uh, it, it is difficult to fathom why anyone would celebrate a coup. Uh, uh, celebrate a military government. So where did we go wrong, uh, Stan? We went wrong from the very beginning. Uh, you you never celebrate a military government because a military whilst, government, a military whilst, government, yes. Whilst you are still there, tell me at that moment, what was your role within the MDC? Well, I, I was not part of the MDC. I was just an independent uh, I'm a sympathizer and a supporter of the MDC, but uh, I did not have any official role in the MDC. So I was just uh, here watching like everybody else and uh, being asked to commentate on what was happening. And I knew uh, the people who were taking charge. These are the people who had been behind Mugabe for all these years. These were the real enforcers of the Mugabe regime. Mugabe was the face of it. You know, they were the enforcers. So for me, there wasn't any new leaf that was being turned. There was no new chapter. This was just, uh, you know, old wine in new bottles. So I did not understand the euphoria. Uh, you know, I, I did not agree with the euphoria. Uh, people were happy because they wanted Mugabe to go. And I also wanted uh, Mugabe to go. But I did not believe that uh, the military coup or indeed even that the uh, uh, inception of a military government, because that is what it is, 10. It's a military government with a civilian face. If people don't accept that, then they are deluded, you see. Yeah. Uh, so so we went wrong the very moment that we went the military route. And uh, the, the military route is one that is uh, uh, very rigid. Uh, that's why you don't see any respect for, for human rights you don't see any respect for the freedoms that we have often taken for granted. Now, this regime is very crafty because it, it, it gives a false impression that it is democratic, that it is changing laws. So, for example, they've changed the Public Order and Security Act. It is now, you know, the Maintenance of Peace Act or something like that, MOPA. Uh, they've changed the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act. I think they now call it the Freedom of Information Act. Now, all those are nice sounding pieces of legislation, but has anything changed? In fact, things have gotten worse. Uh, you get journalists being jailed. We, you know, you hope Chimono for exposing corruption. Of course, they choose another charge, but everybody knows that he's being punished for exposing corruption. Uh, you, you get, uh, you know, women are abducted, uh, sexually assaulted. You had a young man recently, Tawanda Mcheiwa in Mulawa. He was uh, abducted, he was tortured. Uh, now he's suffered renal failure. Look, the, the regime has never changed from what it was. The regime learned very well from colonial Rhodesia, and uh, it was brutal. This regime learned well from the Mugabe regime, and it is still as brutal as it was before. So what went wrong? What went wrong was we have always been on the wrong path with a wrong set of leaders who do not have the interests of the people at heart, who are only interested in self-aggrandizement. And, and on that point of what happened in 2017, um, there are a number of people uh, or sectors of society that believed that the end justified the means at that moment. And this mm -hmm. also, will, I, I would like to get your, your comment on that. Uh, also, in the current situation, where people say at that moment, within the opposition, you know, uh, circles, or within any other ways you'd think of, 
that would change things, at least just from a power perspective, there wasn't hope. Um, and but then the military assisted in this transition. Hmm. And then the question becomes, was that, would you still think that making the same decision would be good? Why do I ask that question? We are now in 2020. We don't know what's happening, but we hear all sorts of rumors. There then comes a question of looking at the situation on the ground. Would there be a solution even now that does not involve the army? Because mm -hmm. that's why that question becomes important. Mm -hmm. Well, Stan, uh, I I don't like the term military assisted transition. That's <laughs> what uh, a lot of people called it in 2017, and they were wrong to do so. And and I think that events over the past two years, three years, have proven why it was wrong. Because you see, how you characterize something matters. If you characterize something as a in in such benevolent, uh, generous terms you you end up giving a false impression of what things are if people had called it a coup and characterized it for what it was at the time i think that people would have been more prepared for what was to come you would have allowed them to take power without people participating in it but people were used <laughs> people marched in that in those streets without realizing what they were what they were marching for that they were marching for for the monster uh, that is now governing them so, so there is a big problem, you know. Yes, you know. Again, we have that situation. Your question is: Is there anything that might change without the military? Well, if the military wants to do anything to change things within their own establishment, let them do it, but don't get people involved. Let people know. We have had situations in other countries. Zimbabwe is not an island. Take Nigeria, for example. Nigeria had perhaps had about thirty or forty years of of military coups and military governments. It was highly unstable. And uh, in, in the 1990s, they ended up with uh, perhaps the worst dictator of them all, uh, Sani Abacha. And then it just happened that Sani Abacha uh, uh, died uh, in, in 1999, I think, uh, or was it earlier? Uh, maybe a, a year earlier, but we, we had uh, uh, General Abu Bakr uh, who then became the leader of Nigeria after the death of uh, Sani Apache. And uh, he was the man who then opened up the way to democracy in Nigeria uh, with the first uh, you know, elections. I think it was in 1999, democratic elections. Nigeria has been having elections, uh, democratic elections since then. I would not say that they are perfect elections. There are, of course, many irregularities. I was fortunate to be a member of an election observer team in Nigeria in their election last year. Um, it wasn't a perfect election, but you can see that this is a large nation, you know, of so many people, which is trying very hard to come to terms with this democracy after so many decades of military coups and military governments. They haven't had that uh, in in such a flagrant form as we as we as they had before. So. Is there a chance for Zimbabwe to have someone like a General Abubakar? Well, it's possible. It's possible. But I, I, I don't think that uh, at the moment I'd see anything on the horizon. The military just has to understand and realize that it does not have a place in governing the country if it wants to be a democracy. Zimbabwe will remain a pariah state as long as it is governed in the way that it is now. They can have power, but they will not be able to exercise it peacefully and comfortably. And and in its current form, the opposition is it mm -hmm. any sort? Of well, you know, I think that uh, I, I I want to use this example. Uh, of course, I use it with caution, uh, but I want to remind people that when you have an abusive relationship uh, between the abuser and the abused. It is not uncommon for people who start uh, initially by condemning the abuser. Uh, after a few years, they end up saying the abused is also a problem. This happens even in families. Uh, you get people saying, you know, the, the wife, the wife is the problem. 
uh, why is she doing this or why is she doing that? Uh, alternatively, if it is the husband who is being abused, they say the husband is the problem. Now, uh, in, in Zimbabwe, we have had this situation with the ruling party and the opposition. This is not to say that the opposition is perfect. You know, it's a political organization which is comprised of human beings. They make mistakes, they make errors, but, but we should never ever forget <laughs> that the monster in the house is the ruling party, ZANU-PF. ZANU-PF is the author of Zimbabwe's challenges. Is the opposition any better? I think that uh, that question is difficult, is, cannot be answered with any sincerity unless the opposition has had an opportunity to be in government. Why don't you give them power? Why don't you allow them to lead? Why didn't they allow them to lead in 2008? You know, the world would have seen that Shangirai is either a good leader or is a bad leader, but they were never given that opportunity. So if you ask me, there is no comparison between ZANU-PF and the MDC as long as one has held power for 40 years and the other one has never yeah. been in power. Mm. Yeah, but I'm also interested in terms of the hope to bring change, the, the hope to, to, yeah. to get oh, yeah. change. Yeah, yeah. No, of course, yeah, I think, oh, yes, I think it's a good question as well. Uh, but look, may I also just point mm -hmm. out, and this goes to anybody in Africa or anybody in the world, when you say the opposition, you are not talking about 10 or 20 leaders. The opposition is the people. You know, I often see a lot of people say, where is the opposition? And I often ask them, what are you? Where do you fit in? Where do you see yourself? You are the opposition. You are the one who is supposed to stand up for your rights. So you don't, you don't outsource your responsibility, your power to a few leaders. Yes, they must inspire. Yes, they must do things to, to make things happen, to lead people, to show people the way. But at the end of the day, the people must also be willing to participate. They must also be willing to take on a role, to, to agree, to accept that I am the opposition, not to say the opposition is there. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, you know, let's, let's then dive into to something Related to that, um, of the people taking earlier, you spoke about how difficult it is to make Zimbabweans angry, and I'm in no way trying to advocate that Zimbabweans should be angry, but there is a sense of a people that are dejected, a sense of a people that find a way to leave the country and. As long as I've left the country, I'm all right. How does one begin to take this initiative to want Zimbabweans generally to be very active, to take things into their own hands and take that, you know, leading role to understand that whatever it is that I want to be in my life, just like the guys told me what they did in the United States, we realize that our freedom will only come by own our own activities. Well, uh, you know, yes, it's very difficult to provoke Zimbabweans into into anger, uh, but I think that it's both a, a strength, but uh, some may see it as a weakness. Uh, it's a strength because you want to be able to maintain your cool. You don't want to be easily provoked. Uh, I think that we have been a peaceful nation generally because of this capacity to accept uh, different viewpoints uh, without getting angry and violent. Um, but, but you know, there are also some challenges with people who become, uh, 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 you know, they fight among each other, uh, which is, uh, which is, uh, you know, you, you, you get you get a lot of a, a lot of acrimony, especially on social media. You would want some of this energy to be translated into the field for people to really uh, start engaging in a more robust way. They, they I think that... <laughs> yes, but I think that Zimbabweans, you know, you can see how Zimbabweans are coming together and starting to do things in a way that is more coordinated. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it has been said before, I think the court is attributed to Frederick Douglass. Uh, an American anti-slavery campaigner in the in the 19th century, 
and uh, he said that uh, the life of a dictatorship or of uh, a, an autocratic or of oppression uh, is, is only determined by the capacity of people to endure that oppression. And I think that there is a breaking point and it's, it's coming, you can see it now, you can see with, with what's happening with the Zimbabwe Lives Matter hashtag, which has gone through around the world. And, uh, you know, people are beginning to feel noticed. People are beginning to see that their pleas are being uh, uh, recognized around the world. And I think it's giving people more confidence to stand up for themselves. And it will happen. You know, we, we have had countries which have been ruled by dictators for 30, 40 years. You know, countries like Sudan, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, and uh, nobody could have expected things to have taken the turn that they took over the uh, uh, the last uh, 20 years or so in which there have been some revolutions in those countries. So Zimbabwe, with Zimbabweans, I think it is wrong to underestimate their resolve. Uh, the more things get difficult, I think people will begin to have more confidence, especially when the world recognizes and accepts their concerns. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Now that's, uh, that's uh, interesting. And, you know, as, as we wrap up, Yes. Now, you have a lot of young people mm -hmm. that whose dreams and aspirations went down the drain. A generation that a lot of people don't know what is it they're looking up to. A lot of people very intelligent, uh, people who are industrial, uh, people who are capable, uh, that have given up, that have gotten to a point of saying, you know what? It is what it is. Now, this is not just about the point, but just about the drive. Like, uh, you know, I've done some bit of traveling. You meet people in other continents, in other countries, and you meet young people, they have so much plans, you know, to say, I want to achieve this, I'm going to do this, and after five years, I'll do this. If I do this, then in seven years' time, I'll be in that place, and after 10 years. How does one, and what would you say to such young people? How do, how do we get ourselves to get there as well as about the majority of us? Of course, there is those of us who are there, but majority of us, how do we revive that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that the most important thing is for the young people to recognize that it is their future that is at stake. I think it's important for young people to also acknowledge the fact that the older people are the authors of their problems. They cannot be expected to be the authors of the solutions. They don't have the capacity to do so. They don't have the interest to do so. There is no incentive for a 77 year old leader and uh, his peers around that generation who probably don't have 10, 20 years to make things better because they are not looking at 30, 40 years in advance like the young people are. Yeah. So yeah. my call is for young people to appreciate that they cannot put their bets on the older people. And I want to especially talk to young people in ruling parties because they are the ones who are easily manipulated. They are looking at the here and now. They defend these old men and women who do not have a future to look forward to. Old men and women who are sacrificing the future of the young people. It doesn't make any sense. I think that the young people need to understand that as much as they should acknowledge and respect the history of their elders, they are the ones who should be taking the baton Take, for example, you have someone today, I was just thinking of General uh, Chiwenga, retired General Chiwenga, who is said to be about 63, 64 years old. Uh, 40 years ago, he would have been 23, 24 years old. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> if you think about it, so, uh, and, and he was already, he was already, you know, serving in the military. Uh, and he rose to become a general, you know. Uh, if you think about it, the people we are calling young now, 
Mm? General Chiwenga is 63 now. Uh, he was 43 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, that's when the MDC was being formed. Mm? And uh, 20 years ago, uh, he would have been younger than I am now. I'm turning 45 this year. So, so the point I want to make is that, uh, is that uh, uh, young people should, should really take up a stand because nobody is going to do it on their behalf. The older people who are there now in power were also young once. And when they were young, they were doing things. They were doing things that we think are impossible for us to do, that we think we are prohibited from doing. I've already given you examples of how young these people were when they became ministers, when they became generals, when they became uh, leaders of their communities. So the people that we are saying are young people today, we are describing them as if they don't have power. I would like them to have more confidence in their abilities, confidence in what they can do, and that they should be standing up for themselves because if they don't, nobody's going to do it for them. That's my closing remark and point of encouragement to the young people. Sir Alex, Mr. Magaisa, Dr. Magaisa, <laughs> <laughs> One more day, you know, I can, um, <laughs> time, um, to be yeah. with us, uh, you know, you are oozing with knowledge and experience. Um, and we really appreciate that. As Baobab Chats, mm -hmm. we are bringing together young Africans across the continent across, and across the globe, mm -hmm. studying how do we start to take action? How mm -hmm. do we carry the, band, the battle? You were talking about the likes of Tabo Mbeki when they were mediating in Zimbabwe, that mm -hmm. because of their own ties and the issue you were talking about youngness, you know, th those ties you're talking about, they grew those ties when they were in their 20s. <laughs> These guys in their 30s. Exactly, exactly, so, exactly. As the 20s, 30s, 40s of today, how do we come together? We need to find a common purpose, we need mm -hmm. to find a vision, even mm -hmm. if it's common vision, but at least we need to be able to give each other a hand and a leg up. Thank yeah. you so much. We really appreciate the time. Um, you know, this has been great. Mr. Magaisa, um, there's something that we can't live without talking about. I can't yeah. see it clearly. What, what is that that is behind you? There? Okay. Uh, so, so behind me, uh, it, it's a picture collage uh, um, of this house where I am, uh, we, we, we picked it up when it was uh, old and broken and we reconstructed it. So it's, it's like a reminder every time I look at it, it's a reminder of, of, of what it was and, and what it is now. The point I want to make, uh, the point that is always inspiring to me, you see, my, my wife likes to you know, buy these old houses and then to, to fix them. And I help here and there. Uh, so what we do is uh, we, we get these old, uh, you know, broken houses and you reconstruct them to, to make them better, uh, to make them more livable and uh, more comfortable. So, so this is a picture collage which shows how this house was at the beginning and what it is like now. And uh, for me, this is how I also approach Zimbabwe. This is how I approach uh, issues. You can take something that is old and broken and you can make it better. You can take something uh, that is in a desperate state and you can give it hope. And, and for me, uh, this is a metaphor for, for my country, a metaphor for Africa, a, a metaphor for any of the challenges that we may face in our lives, that whatever it is, uh, look at it, uh, work on it, and it will get better. So that that is my special reminder, and I hope that it inspires a, a few more people out there. So besides writing and besides all the other stuff that I do, uh, this is something that uh, occupies us. As soon as I finish with you right now, I'm going to go outside and uh, try and fix my garden. Wow.